Good evening and welcome to Let's Play Metal Gear Solid 3. This is going to be a blind playthrough. Uh, for those of you who haven't been following right along, I have played Metal Gear 1, Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2 as well. Those were also blind playthroughs, so you can head back to my channel if you missed those and you're interested in that kind of thing. Otherwise, for those of you who've been following along eagerly waiting for this, at last, it's here. So let's get right in here and see what we've got. New game. I... I don't know, I assume I like all of them. It's all good. Extreme and European extreme. I wonder what the difficulty difference is there. Um... We'll do it on hard. We'll do it on hard. We can do this. It might get rough at times, but we're going to make it happen. After the end of World War II... After the end of oh. World War II, the world was split into two, East and West. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. And that's the voice of Snake. Quite excited to hear that. Yep, David Hayter. Hmm. Oh, nineteen sixty four. Altitude thirty thousand feet. Approaching Soviet airspace. 20 minutes to drop off. Commencing internal depressurization. Equipment check. Arm main parachute. All right. You ready to go? Drop zone still showing a high pressure mass. Cab okay. Good. We've got high visibility. Is this the man himself? Ah, oh, yep. There's Snake. Put out that cigar. Connecting oxygen hose to interior connector. Put on your mask. Look at him, he's like, I'll do it when I'm good and ready. Does this panty waste know what he's doing? Hey now. This is solid sneak you're talking about. Approaching release point. Ten minutes to drop off. Hey, are you deaf? He said put out the cigar and put on your mask. Settle down, guys. Depressurization complete. Checking oxygen supply. Six minutes to drop off. Opening rear hatch. a little exciting that as we go forward in the series, we get better and better graphics. You'll be falling at 130 miles per hour. Wow. Try not to get frostbite from the wind chill. One minute to drop off. Move to the rear. Activate the alarm bottle. This is one for the history books. The world's first halo jump. Ten seconds to drop off. Stand by. Status okay. All green. Prepare for drop off. Countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Spread your wings and fly. God be with you. All right, there we go. Cutscenes. That would be kind of an awesome thing to do. 
Or just like skydiving in general. I've never been skydiving. Jack, I've got some important news. Wait, Jack? The head of the CIA has finally given us the green light for the virtuous mission. Virtual mission? No, the virtuous mission. Mm. The future of our Fox unit depends on it. If it succeeds, we'll be officially organized into a unit. Virtuous mission? Sounds like some kind of initiation ritual. You know, don't get cocky. This isn't a training op. Right. So what exactly is this wonderful mission? Well, about two years ago, a certain Soviet scientist requested asylum in the West through one of our moles. His name is Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov. He's head of the OKB-754 Design Bureau, one of the Soviet's top secret weapon research facilities, and the East's foremost expert on weapons development. Sokolov? Isn't he that famous rocket scientist? The very same. Hmm. On April the 12th, 1961, the Soviets achieved the first manned spaceflight in history. The Earth was blue, but there was no God. Well spoken. The rocket that carried Yuri Gagarin to orbit was the A-1, known as the Vostok rocket. Sokolov is said to be the man most responsible for the multi-engine cluster used in that rocket. After Gagarin's flight, Sokolov left rocket development to become the head of the newly established Design Bureau. From a lowly technician to head of a Design Bureau, that's quite a success story. So why do you want to defect? It seems he'd become afraid of his own creations. Afraid? Hmm. Call it a crisis of conscience. And for that, he left his country and his family behind and went over the fence? Not exactly. One of his conditions was that his family was also to be taken safely to the West. We used a mole to get the family out first and succeeded in sneaking Sokolov over the Berlin Wall shortly afterwards. I was the one who conducted the operation. The security on the eastern side was still full of holes back then. Then what? We got Sokolov over in one piece, but the whole ordeal had left him exhausted and we checked him into a hospital in West Berlin. It took him two weeks and more than 600 miles to get from the research facility in the Soviet Union to Berlin. He was in no condition to say anything coherent. And it was only a week later that we had something much bigger on our hands. Hmm. The Cuban Missile Crisis. October the 16th, 1962, President Kennedy received word that the Soviets were in the process of deploying intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba. The president demanded that the Soviets dismantle and remove the missiles. At the same time, he announced a naval blockade to prevent further missile shipments from reaching Cuba. But the Soviets didn't back down, instead placing their armed forces on secondary alert. Soviet transport ships carrying missiles continued on course towards Cuba. US and Soviet forces went on alert for an all-out nuclear war. Frantic negotiations were conducted through the UN's Emergency Security Council and unofficial channels to end the hair-trigger standoff. Finally, on October the 28th, the Soviet Union agreed to remove its missiles from Cuba. And so the world avoided a nuclear holocaust. But in order to get the Soviets to pull their missiles out, we had to make a deal. You mean the one where the US agreed to remove its IRBMs from Turkey? No. The Jupiter IRBMs deployed in Turkey were obsolete. And we were going to get rid of them anyway. They had no strategic value whatsoever All to right. the US so what was the real the deal? The Turkey deal was a ruse, a cover story that was fed to the other intelligence agencies around the world. So what did the Russians really want? Sokolov. Oh. They wanted us to return Sokolov. You mean the Soviets pulled out of Cuba just to get their hands on Sokolov? That's right. What the hell was he working on? Something important. At the time, we had no idea. We were running out of time. To either give up Sokolov or risk full-scale nuclear war. In the end, we had no choice. President Kennedy gave in to Khrushchev's demand. The next day, I got Sokolov out of the hospital, handing him over to agents on the eastern side. Sokolov kept on screaming, save me, until he disappeared from my side. Mm. Sucks, but then there wasn't really another solution. We received some new information from one of our moles. About Sokolov? Yes. He was taken back to the research facility and forced to continue working on the weapon in question under KGB supervision. What's more, it's on the verge of completion. 
So what kind of weapon is it? Something to do with space rockets? No. Missiles. Same technology. I guess you're right. We don't know the details, but it appears to be a new kind of nuclear device. For half a year now, the Soviets have been conducting frequent nuclear tests at Semipalatinsk. Something to do with the weapon, I assume. We're talking about a secret weapon so big that Khrushchev was ready to pull out of Cuba to get it back. Is Sokolov still in a facility? No. According to our intelligence, he's in Selino Yask, a place in the mountains about three miles to the west that's known as the Virgin Cliffs. The Virgin Cliffs? Nice name for a virtuous mission. <laughs> They moved him there just recently. Why? Apparently, they're conducting a field test of the weapon, but it's our best chance to get him back. This mission would never have been possible if he was still in the research facility. This is our last chance. Sokolov must have known that too when he contacted us. Oh. Okay, um... But it raises the question, what are we gonna do when we take him back? Like, aren't the Soviets gonna figure out it was us? How does this not put us right back in a Bay of Pigs situation? Oh well, we'll do what needs to be done. I would totally go skydiving. That would be so much fun. Terrifying, but exhilarating. Your mission is to infiltrate Selino Yask in the Soviet mountains, ensure the safety of Sokolov, and bring him back to the West. Okay, but what's with all the Jack? His name is Dave. That's what he said in the first if one. If we don't get Sokolov back before that weapon is complete, we'll be facing a major crisis. Is the Jack a code name? <laughs> Once we've confirmed the rescue of Sokolov, stand by at the recovery point. A recovery balloon will be dropped at that point. Helium will be pumped into the balloon to inflate it. The process takes about 20 minutes. Once it's complete, the gunship's arm will latch onto the balloon and pull it up. The Fulton surface-to-air recovery system. I'm familiar with the theory. Take it easy. It's been combat-proof. Do you think Sokolov is up to it? The shock will be less than during a parachute jump, and the arm can handle up to 500 pounds. So you're planning on going over the border in a single combat talent? She's equipped with two 6-barrel 20mm Vulcan cannons, as well as two 40mm machine guns. Sounds like she could hold her own against a battalion of tanks. Even with the fuel in the reserve tank, we're facing a four-hour time limit. If all goes well, it shouldn't take more than a few hours home in time for dinner but if anything goes wrong well you'll be eating dinner breakfast and all the rest of your meals in the jungle what's that not about are they conspiring I'm suspicious That's a rough landing. Da -da -da. All right, it was a pretty cool, dramatic beginning. Gotta give it that. Kind of excited to be running around in a jungle. What did you hear something? being cautious. So if this is set prior to the you other ones... It. 
You're already in enemy territory, and somebody might be listening in. Oh, we do get code From extra? here on out, we'll be using code names to refer to each other. Your code name for this mission will be Naked Snake. Naked Snake? I'll be referring to you as Snake from now on. You're not to mention your real name. Snake? Yeah. But you don't like snakes? What do you mean? Well, you've eaten one before, haven't you? In survival training. Huh? <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I don't know if I'd ever order one in a restaurant, but... Be careful. You might not have a choice. What about you, Major? What should I call you? Hmm. Let's see. I'll be... I'll be Tom. Call me Major Tom. <laughs> this will be a sneaking mission. You must not be seen by the enemy. You must leave no trace of your presence. Is that clear? Yep. This kind of infiltration is the Fox unit's speciality. In other words, weapons and equipment are procure on site. That goes for food as well. You're completely naked, just as your name implies. Great. Now I see why you asked me if I like snakes. I suppose calling me Snake was your idea of a joke, too. No. There's a good reason for that. I'll tell you later when the time is right. Gotcha. Because snakes are Getting sneaky. Getting back to the subject, ah. how exactly am I supposed to feed myself? Find rations. You've been issued a knife and a tranquilizer gun. Use them to hunt for food. Really? You'll also find some medical supplies in your backpack. Yeah, about the backpack. <laughs> I lost it in a tree on the way down. Well, I look see. for it. Well, you'd better go back and get it then. You know where it is? Kinda. No problem. I can see it from here. It's stuck on a branch. To climb a tree, stand in front of a tree that's covered in ivy and press the action button. All right. I'll be monitoring your progress over the radio. We can't risk violating Soviet airspace, but I'll be in the gunship. My frequency is 140.85. I'll give you a call if I need to talk to you. If you need to talk to me, Use the send function. Okay, Snake, go get your backpack. Oh, all right then. I mean, this is our normal snake, right? It looks like him, it sounds like him. The jack thing's really confusing me. Okay, let's mess around with some buttons. Okay. Okay, got a knife. Excellent. Revival pill. Espionage pill developed by the CIA. Can wake up from fake death. Hm. Alright then. I hear stuff rustling around here. I'm actually super excited to be just roaming around in the jungle. This is pretty cool. Oh, and I need to remember to look for it. Ivy covered trees to climb. All right. Up, up, all the way up. There you go. Yeah, there's... I would freak out in a jungle if there really is this much rustling everywhere. Be convinced something's always out to get me. Okay. Action. Um. Climb the tree. I'm hitting every wrong button, I guess. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Okay, so... Oh, is this not the backpack tree? I thought it was. No, it's just a tree. Oh, no, it is. There it is. I just need to pay attention. Okay. Pick it up. <gasps> there we go. Excellent. Yeah!
I see you've retrieved your backpack, Snake. Mm-hmm. To equip a weapon, it's necessary to take it out of your backpack. In the survival viewer, choose weapon from the backpack. Your available weapons will be displayed in a window in the upper left. From that list, choose the weapon you want to equip and press the enter button. For other equipped items, just do the same thing from item. Got it. Use the survival viewer backpack. Yep, that's right. Survival is fundamental to this mission. I imagine it's fundamental After to most missions. After you've been out missions. in the field for a while, your stamina will start to drop. Oh. If your stamina gets too low, it'll affect your performance. You won't be able to shoot accurately, for example, and your wounds won't heal as smoothly. Keep an eye on your stamina so you don't run out. To recover lost stamina, you can hunt for local flora and fauna. You can use either your tranquilizer gun or your knife to hunt. My only weapon is a Mark 22 Hush Puppy tranquilizer gun? That's right. It's been fitted with its own suppressor. However, the suppressor will deteriorate every time you fire. Oh. Once its durability reaches zero, the noise suppression effect will be gone. So don't get too trigger happy with it. The suppressor's durability is shown in the icon. Any weapons and equipment beyond what you're carrying now, you'll have to find as you go. I have to find my own weapons and equipment? Whose crazy idea was this anyway? Oh, snake. Solo covert actions are standard Fox operating procedure. You can't leave any traces of your presence. No weapons, equipment, footprints, sweat, or bodily waste. The same goes for bullets and cartridges, too. Your presence in enemy territory is already a violation of international conventions of warfare. There aren't supposed to be any American soldiers in Russia. It could spark an international incident. You can't let anyone see you. You can't let the enemy know you're there. This is a stealth mission. You're a ghost snake in every sense of the word. And there'll be no rescue if you're captured. The military and U.S. government will deny any involvement in the affair. Got it. Then I'll just have to take care of myself, huh? I'm afraid so. You've been given a fake death pill for that purpose. SIS guidelines stipulate that soldiers on covert ops like this one issued a potassium cyanide capsule. Tape it to your body so you can take it when you need to. How generous of you. Use it if you're taken prisoner by the enemy. They send you into a state of false death for a short time. Fooling them into thinking that I'm really dead. So how do I come back to life? Just take the revival pill. You mean that thing they put in my tooth before the mission? That's the one. But be careful. If you remain in a state of false death for too long, nothing will be able to bring you back. Remember that. Okay. I'll keep it in mind. You said this was a solo mission, right? Right. I guess that means I can't count on any reinforcements. Uh, no. Correct. The mission rests entirely in your hands. The real one-man army. Relax. There's a support team ready to back you up over the radio. Who? I'll introduce them to you. This time, survival is of utmost importance. The first member of the support team will be in charge of monitoring your physical condition. Acting as a medic, so to speak. All right. As well as recording your mission data. She's a member of Fox as well, and she's here on the gunship with me. She? The gal we saw in the cutscene. Hello, Snake. I'm paramedic. Nice to meet you. Paramedic. That's her name? As in a medic who comes in by parachute. Aren't you going to tell me your real name? No. Are you going to tell me yours, Mr. Snake? My name, huh? It's John Doe. And they call you Jack for short. You're a regular Captain Nemo. A name means nothing on the battlefield. After a week, no one has a name. What's your name? Jane Doe. Very funny. Well, fair is fair. I wasn't joking, but I'll tell you my name only if you manage to make it back alive. My frequency is 145.73. She's also in charge of recording your mission data. Whenever you want to save, send a message over the reserved save frequency, 140.96. So saving lets me record my mission data. That's right. It also records the state of your health. Good to know. There's one more person I want to introduce you to, Snake. All right. Huh. Speaking of snakes, you remember the boss, don't you? How could I forget? A legendary soldier and your mentor. Actually, it was the boss that got the DCI's authorization in the first place. She's going to be serving as Fox's mission advisor. The boss is? She also helped me plan this mission. She and I were at SAS together. Jack, is that you? How many years is it then? Boss? Huh. That's right. It's me. 
Talk to me. Let me hear your voice. It's been five years, 72 days, and 18 hours. All right. You've lost weight. You can tell just by the sound of my voice. Of course I can. I know all about you. Really? Well, I don't know anything about you. What's that supposed to mean? Why'd you disappear on me all of a sudden? I was on a top secret mission. <laughs> you didn't need me anymore. But there were still so many things I wanted you to teach me. No. I taught you everything you needed to know about fighting techniques. I taught you all I could. The rest you needed to learn on your own. Techniques, sure. But what about how to think like a soldier? How to think like a soldier? I can't teach you that. A soldier needs to be strong in spirit, body, and technique. And the only thing you can learn from someone else is technique. In fact, technique doesn't even matter. What's most important is spirit. Spirit and body are like two sides of a single coin. They're the same thing. I can't teach you how to think. You'll just have to figure it out for yourself. Listen to me, Jack. Just because soldiers are on the same side right now doesn't mean they always will be. Having personal feelings about your comrades is one of the worst sins you can commit. Politics determine who you face on the battlefield. And politics are a living thing. They change along with the times. Yesterday's good might be tomorrow's evil. Is that why you abandoned me? No, it had nothing to do with you. I already told you, Jack, I was on a top secret mission. A soldier has to follow whatever orders he's given. It's not his place to question why, hmm. but you're looking for a reason to fight. You're a natural born fighter, but you're not quite a soldier. A soldier is a political tool, nothing more. That's doubly true if he's a career soldier. Right and wrong have no place in his mission. He has no enemies and no friends. Only the mission. You follow the orders you're given. That's what being a soldier is. I do whatever I have to to get the job done. I don't think about politics. That's not the same thing. Sooner or later, your conscience is going to bother you. In the end, you have to choose whether you're going to live as a soldier or just another man with a gun. There's a saying in the Orient, loyalty to the end. Do you know what it means? Being patriotic. It means devoting yourself to your country. I follow the president and the top brass. I'm ready to die for them if necessary. The president and the top brass won't be there forever. Once their terms are up, others will take their place. I follow the will of the leader, no matter who's in charge. Even if he commands People you to do things you don't want to? The missions. Then who does? The times. People's values change over time. And so do the leaders of a country. So there's no such thing as an enemy in absolute terms. The enemies we fight are only enemies in relative terms, constantly changing with the times. As long as we have loyalty to the end, there's no point in believing in anything, even in those we love. And that's the way a soldier's supposed to think. The only thing we can believe in with absolute certainty is the mission, Jack. All right. But do me a favor. What is it? Call me Snake. Snake? Oh, right. Your code name is Snake. It suits you well. In what way? That's right. The legendary unit that the boss put together during World War II was a snake. The Cobra unit. A group of heroes that brought the war to an end and saved the world. As long as you've got a legendary hero backing you up, you'll be fine. Isn't that right, Snake? Yeah. I can't think of anyone else I'd rather have with me. Oh. And one more thing, boss. Yes? It's good to hear your voice again. Same here. After all, who knows if either of us will make it out alive. Why wouldn't Snake, you? You are always best at urban warfare and infiltrating buildings. But this is the jungle. Survival is going to be key. Those CQC techniques I taught you are sure to come in handy. CQC? Close quarters combat, huh? I've been in the Green Berets for the past few years. I'm probably pretty rusty. Not to worry. I'll be here to help you remember. After all, this is your first actual survival mission. I'll be supporting you over the radio. Where are you, boss? Next to the Major? The boss is communicating with us by radio from aboard a permit-class submarine in the Arctic Ocean. My frequency is 
Call me if you need my advice on battle techniques. Gotcha. Your mission is to retrieve Dr. Sokolov. Dr. Sokolov is being held in an abandoned factory located to the north of your current position. Avoid heavy combat and don't let anyone see you. Don't forget that this is a stealth mission. I know you've said that numerous times. They just gave us just a whole bunch of interesting things to think over there. Now, when they said that she was Please, boss... Try to remember some of the basics of CQC. I thought it was meaning, like, Big Boss. But no, she's... I'm not sure who she is. Commencing virtuous mission now. So anyhow, let's, yeah, just in case, I don't, I want to make sure that I'm not like, I don't know, stamina going down or whatever. She said a lot of really interesting things there, and she did make, I, I appreciate her point about the enemy changes with the times, and she's right, it's true. I mean, if you think about this, this is, this is a game made in Japan about a soldier in the US, there was a time Japan and America were enemies, especially when they're talking about, you know, World War II stuff, but now we're allies. Japan Japan isn't an enemy of America at all anymore, and America's not an enemy of Japan. You know? We're friend countries, but there was a time where we weren't. These things they do change over time. I mean if you'll go way back in time, England and America for at a for a time we're enemies and now we're we're pals <laughs> so i mean she's kind of really the, the enemy isn't eternal it does change and it is based on politics but some of the stuff she says just kind of rankles me like i don't know the that there's it, it's hard to say when she says you just have to follow it just matters about the mission a soldier just follows orders and doesn't question i that's I don't know, that's debatable. That's really dangerous thinking. I think sometimes, I don't know, I can see both sides of it. I can see where an ideal soldier would be someone who just follows orders and always and just does whatever he's told to do to the best of his or her ability, but you have a moral obligation. I mean, if you if you follow orders and the orders are to commit crimes against humanity, then it's not excusable just that you're a soldier following orders. I mean, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to have some questions about the morality of the orders given to you. And I also don't like her whole, just fight for yourself, fight for the mission, fight for only your country, and the, you can't have friends and loved ones, and you can't care about your comrades. I think she's wrong. I think people tend to be stronger if they're fighting for someone. I, I would think getting along with the soldiers you're fighting with, caring about your comrades, gives you greater incentive to succeed. Because then you're not just fighting and risking everything for this sort of... I mean, patriotism is important, but also if you're only fighting for country... It, a country is the people that make it up. Country is too cold of an idea, I think. I'm just fighting for my country. It's too impersonal. You fight for the people who make up your country. You fight for your comrades. That's part of your country. Your family, your friends, the people you love. Those are the ones that make up your country, and that's why you love your country, because of the people that are the country. So, I, I don't know. I disagree with her on that. I think, I think it's very important to have people you hold dear. Because that will make you to, that will make you fight stronger than if you're just fighting for this more disembodied ideal of country. But very interesting stuff. I you gotta love these games that they give you some. They they really throw some things at you to think about. Now let's take a look at everything we got here. So camouflage. I can change my face paint. Plus five, huh? Because I am in the woodland here. <laughs> and then mask used for disguise looks an awful lot like Raiden. Uh, okay, so woodland's probably what we want. 
Yeah, we can do whatever, huh? We could be all patriotic if we want. Italy's plus five. Okay, well, I think we want woodland. Yeah. Okay. And we can change our uniform too. Naked. <laughs> there we go. No, I'm not gonna, um. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Okay. Olive drag. Tiger stripe. Leaf. Leaf is looking like the one. Let's just see what these look like. So there's our basic. Tree bark's not that great though, huh? That doesn't attempt to blend in with anything. This is good in a shadowy area. Desert tiger. Okay, so wait. So there's the leaf that we could do, except... Oh no, the flactarn's not quite as good as the leaf. Alright, leaf it is. What we got in our backpack? Survival knife, MK-22, directional mic. D the directional mic is a weapon, eh? Binocular scar, fake death pill, revival pill, anti-personnel sensor, huh? Alright. Oh, actually. Do we want that on? I don't know, maybe. No food yet. Is this just gonna be... Yeah, this is all the gameplay stuff, that's fine. Ooh, and a map. Alright, and then... Ah, select for this. So... How do we... Oh, there we go. Major Tom. Paramedic, the boss. Let's go ahead and save. Saving a game, Snake? Yep. I am indeed. Yes, please. Hey, Snake, you ever heard of Godzilla, King of Monsters? Who hasn't? No. What is it? True. It's a movie. Oh, uh, we are back in the day here. Oop. It's about this monster called Godzilla, who grows to an enormous size in a nuclear test and goes on a rampage in Tokyo. Nuclear test, huh? Then the Marshall Islands must be crawling with giant monsters right about now. It's just make-believe. Maybe that's why my pants have been so tight lately. <laughs> Snake, it's a movie, not a report out of Los Alamos. I know. So then what happened? Godzilla is immune to all weapons, and humanity has no way to stop the monster. Dr. Sirizawa develops a new type of weapon, but meanwhile, Godzilla is getting closer and closer to Tokyo, obliterating everything in its path. It was originally a Japanese movie, but they made an American version, too. I recommend seeing the original Japanese one if you ever get the chance. It's mostly mindless fun, but it's also got a serious anti nuke message as well. Where can you see the original? <laughs> You'll just have to go to Japan. Really? That's too bad. Well, if you wait 40 years, you might be able to see it in America, too. Why is that? 2004 will be Godzilla's 50th birthday. You think they're still going to be making Godzilla movies, then? Oh, they sure well, are, Snake. Of course. Everybody loves Godzilla. You sure know a lot about movies. I don't suppose you're the movie-watching type, are you? Not really. Okay, then I'll tell you everything I know. When the going gets tough, movies can save your life. It's always good to be able to look at things from a different perspective when you get in a jam. That's the magic of movies. No kidding. Well, I guess it might at least make a nice distraction. That's the spirit, Snake. Have a little fun. All these games, that's so wonderful. <laughs> it's mostly mindless fun, but it has an anti-nuke message as well. Oh, do we know anything like that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and actually wind the episode down here, I think. Uh, please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this. Come back and next time we will start wandering around the woods and hopefully really start to get into the meat of things here. See if we can uh, rescue our doctor or not. I don't know. I have a feeling there's going to be complications along the way.